everyone, it's me again. Uh, just coming back for more uh, mental wealth reads of trauma and recovery. Um, we are going to start chapter two, which is about terror. Um, and uh, again, just as a uh, as a disclaimer, um, please, if you've ever experienced trauma, um, monitor yourself, watch yourself. Um, really pay attention to what you're feeling while you're hearing me read this because uh, it could be a trigger for you and I want you to feel safe um, when we're when we're um, when you're listening to, to me read this and watching these videos and hearing me explain it um, you know and I especially want you to feel safe in general right um, so um, that being said uh, if you need if you are feeling triggered Please stop the video. Please, uh, you know, write down your feelings, uh, process them, or go somewhere where you can, right? Talk to somebody um, or, you know, practice any of the coping skills that you know work for you in these moments um, and make yourself feel safe um, or help yourself feel safe. Um, you know, I don't, again, I don't want this to be the reason why anyone, um, you know, relives things that they've been through that are traumatic for them um, without proper. Uh, care of themselves, um, you know, following that. All right. Um, so with that said, we're going to start chapter two, which is called terror. Psychological trauma is an affliction of the powerless. At the moment of trauma, the victim is rendered helpless by overwhelming force. When the force is that of nature, we speak of disasters. When the force is that of other human beings, we speak of atrocities. Traumatic events overwhelm the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of control, connection, and meaning. It was once believed that such events were uncommon. In 1980, when post-traumatic stress disorder was first included in the diagnostic manual, the American Psychiatric Association, Association described traumatic events as outside the range of usual human experience. Sadly, this definition has proved to be inaccurate. Rape, battery, and other forms of sexual and domestic violence are so common a part of women's lives that they can hardly be described as outside the range of ordinary experience. And in view of the number of people killed in war over the past century, military trauma, too, must be considered a common part of human experience. Only the fortunate find it unusual. Traumatic events are extraordinary, not because they occur rarely, but rather because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptations to life. Unlike commonplace misfortunes, traumatic events generally involve threats to life or bodily integrity, or a close personal encounter with helplessness and terror, sorry, or a close personal encounter with violence and death. They confront humans, be, human beings with the extremities of helplessness and terror and evoke the responses of catastrophe. According to the Comprehensive Textbook of Psychiatry, the common denominator of psychological trauma is a feeling of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation. The severity of traumatic events cannot be measured on any single dimension. Simplistic efforts to quantify trauma ultimately lead to meaningless comparisons of horror. Nevertheless, certain identifiable experiences increase the likelihood of harm. These include being taken by surprise, trapped, or exposed to the point of exhaustion. The likelihood of harm is also increased when the traumatic events include physical violation or injury, exposure to extreme violence, or witnessing grotesque death. In each instance, the salient characteristic of the traumatic event is its power to inspire helplessness and terror. The ordinary human response to danger is a complex, integrated system of reactions encompassing both body and mind. Threat initially arouses the sympathetic nervous system, causing the person in danger to feel an adrenaline rush and go into a state of alert. Threat also concentrates a person's attention on the immediate situation. In addition, threat may alter ordinary perceptions. People in danger are often able to disregard hunger, fatigue, or pain. Finally, threat evokes intense fear, feelings of fear and anger. These changes in arousal, attention, perception, and emotion are normal adaptive reactions. They mobilize the threatened person for strenuous action, either in battle or in flight. Traumatic reactions occur when action is of no avail. 
When neither resistance nor escape is possible, the human system of self-defense becomes overwhelmed and disorganized. Each component of the ordinary response to danger, having lost its utility, tends to persist in an altered and exaggerated state long after the actual danger is over. Traumatic events produce profound and lasting changes in physiological arousal, emotion, cognition, and memory. Moreover, traumatic events may sever these normally integrated functions from one another. The traumatized person may experience intense emotion, but without clear memory of the event, or may remember everything in detail, but without emotion. She may find herself in a constant state of vigilance and irritability without knowing why. Traumatic symptoms have a tendency to become disconnected from their source and to take on a life of their own. This kind of fragmentation, whereby trauma tears apart a complex system of self-protection that normally functions in an integrated fashion, is central to the historic observations on post-traumatic stress disorder. A century ago, Janet Pin Janet pinpointed the essential pathology in hysteria as dissociation. People with this hysteria had lost the capacity to integrate the memory of overwhelming life events. With careful investigation techniques, including hypnosis, Janae de demonstrated that the traumatic memories were preserved in an abnormal state, set apart from ordinary consciousness. He believed that the severing of the normal connections of memory, knowledge, and emotion, and emotion resulted from intense emotional reactions to traumatic events. He wrote of the dissolving effects of intense emotion, which incapacitated the synthesizing function of the mind. Fifty years later, Abram Cardiner described the essential pathology of combat neurosis in similar terms. When a person is overwhelmed by terror and helplessness, the whole apparatus for concerted, coordinated, and purposeful activity is smashed. The perceptions become inaccurate and pervaded with terror. The co coordinative uh, functions of judgment and discrimination fail. The sense organs may even cease to function. The aggressive impulses become disorganized and unrelated to the situation at hand. The functions of the autonomic nervous system may also become disassociated uh, with the rest of the organism. Tra traumatized people feel and act as though their nervous systems have been disconnected from the present. The poet Robert Graves recounts how in civilian life he continued to react as though he were back in the trenches of the First World War. I was still mentally and nervously organized for war. Shells used to come bursting on my bed at night, even though Nancy shared it with me. Strangers in the daytime would assume the faces of friends who had been killed. Would strong enough to climb the hill behind Harlech and visit my favorite country, I could not help seeing it as a prospective battlefield. The many symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder fall into three main categories. These are called hyperarousal, intrusion, and constriction. Hyperarousal reflects the persistent expectation of danger. Intrusion reflects the indelible imprint of the traumatic moment. And constriction reflects the numbing response of surrender. After a traumatic experience, the human system of self-preservation seems to go on to permanent alert, as if the danger might return at any moment. Physiological arousal continu continues unabated. In this state of hyperarousal, which is the first cardinal symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder, the traumatized person startles easily, reacts irritably to small provocations, and sleeps poorly. Card Cardiner proposed that the nucleus of the traumatic neurosis is a physioneurosis. He believed that many of the symptoms observed in combat veterans of the First World War startle reactions, hyperalertness, vigilance for the return of danger, nightmares, and psychosomatic complaints could be understood as resulting from chronic arousal of the autonomic nervous system. He also interpreted the irritability and explosively aggressive behavior of traumatized men as disorganized fragments of shattered fight-or-flight response to overwhelming danger. Similarly, Roy Grinker and John Spiegel observed that tra traumatized soldiers of the Second World War seemed to suffer from chronic stimulation, st stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, the emergency of psychological reactions of anxiety and phys physiological preparedness have overlapped and become non-episodic, but almost continuous. Eventually, the soldier is removed from the environment of stress, and after a time, his subjective anxiety recedes. But the physiological phenomena persist, 
and are now maladapted to a life of safety and security. After the Vietnam War, researchers were able to confirm these hypotheses, documenting alterations in the physio physiology of the sympathetic nervous system in traumatized men. The, psychiatric Lawrence, the psychiatrist Lawrence Kolb, for example, played tapes of combat sounds to Vietnam veterans. The men with post-traumatic stress disorder showed increased heart rate and blood pressure when the tapes were played. Many became so distraught that they asked to discontinue the experiment. Veterans without the disorder uh, and those who had not experienced combat were able to listen to the combat tapes without emotional distress and without significant physiological responses. A wide array of similar studies has now shown that the psychophysiological changes of post-traumatic stress disorder are both extensive and enduring. Patients suffer from a combination of generalized anxiety, symptoms, and specific fears. They do not have a normal baseline level of alert, but relaxed attention. Instead, they have an elevated baseline of arousal. Their bodies are always on the alert for danger. They all also have an extreme startle response to unexpected stimuli, as well as an intense reaction to specific stimuli associated with a traumatic event. It also appears that traumatized people cannot tune out re repetitive stimuli that other people would find merely annoying. Rather, they respond to each repetition as though it were a new and dangerous surprise. The increase in arousal persists during sleep as well as in the waking state, resulting in numerous types of sleep disturbance. But, uh, people with post-traumatic stress disorder take longer to fall asleep, are more sensitive to noise and awaken more frequently during the night than ordinary people. Thus, dramatic events appear to recondition the human nervous system. Long after the danger has passed, traumatized people relive the event as though it were continually recurring in the present. They cannot resume the normal course of their lives, for the trauma, is repeat the trauma repeatedly interrupts. It is a as if time stops at the moment of trauma. The traumatic moment becomes encoded in an abnormal form of memory, which breaks spontaneously into consciousness, both as flashbacks during waking states and as traumatic nightmares during sleep. Small, seemingly insignificant reminders can also evoke these memories, which often return with all the vividness and emotional force of the original event. Thus, even normally safe environments may come to feel dangerous, for the survivor can never be assured that she will not encounter some reminder of the trauma. Trauma arrests the course of normal development by its repetitive intrusion into the survivor's life. Janae described his hysterical patients as dominated by an IDA fixe. Freud, struggling to come to grips with the massive evidence of combat neurosis after the First World War, remarked, The patient is, one might say, fixated to the trauma. This astonishes us far too little. Gardner described fixation on the trauma as one of the essential features of the combat neurosis, noting that traumatic nightmares can reoccur unmodified for years on end. He described the perseverative dream as one of the most characteristic and, at the same time, one of the most enigmatic phenomena we encounter in the disease. Traumatic memories have a number of unusual qualities. They are not encoded like the ordinary memories of adults in a verbal linear narrative that is assimilated into an ongoing life story. Janae explained the difference. Normal memory, like all physiological phenomena, is an action. Essentially, it is the action of telling a story. A situation has not been satisfactorily liquidated until we have achieved not merely an outward reaction through our movements, but also an inward uh, reaction through the words we address to ourselves, through the organization of the recital of the events to others and to ourselves, and through the putting of this recital in its place as one of the chapters in our personal history. Strictly speaking, then, one who retains a fixed idea of a happening cannot be said to have a memory. It is only for convenience that we speak of it as a traumatic memory. The frozen and wordless quality of traumatic memories is captured in Doris Lessing's portrait of her father, a First World War combat veteran who considered himself fortunate to have lost only one, only a leg, uh, while the rest of his company lost their lives in the trenches as Passion Dale. His childhood and young man's memories, kept fluid, were added to, grew, as living memories do. 
But his war memories were congealed in stories that he told again and again, with the same words and gestures and stereotyped phrases. This dark region in him, fate ruled, where nothing, uh, where nothing was true but horror, was expressed inarticulately. In brief, bitter exclamations of rage, incredul incredulity, betrayal. Traumatic memories lack verbal narrative and context. Rather, they are encoded in the form of visit sensations and images. Robert J. Lifton, who studied survivors of Hiroshima, civilian disasters, and combat, describes a traumatic memory as an indelible image or a death imprint. Often, one particular set of images crystallizes the experience, in what Lifton calls the ultimate horror. The intense focus on fragmentary sensation, on image without context, gives the traumatic memory a heightened reality. Tim O'Brien, a combat veteran of the Vietnam War, describes such a traumatic memory. I remember the white bone of an arm. I remember the pieces of skin and something wet and yellow that must have been the intestines. The gore was horrible and stays with me. But what wakes me up 20 years later is Dave Jensen singing Lemon Tree as we threw down the parts. In their predominance of imagery and bodily sensation and in their absence of verbal narrative, traumatic memories resemble the memories of young children. Studies of children, in fact, offer some of the clearest examples of traumatic memory. Among 20 children with documented histories of early trauma, the psychiatrist Lenore Ter found that none of the children could give a verbal description of the events that had occurred before they were uh, two and a half years old. Nonetheless, these experiences were indelibly encoded in memory. 18 of the 20 children showed evidence of traumatic memory in their behavior and their play. They had specific fears related to the traumatic events, and they were able to reenact these events in their play with extraordinary accuracy. For example, a child who had been sexually molested by a babysitter in the first two years of life could not, at age five, remember or name the babysitter. Furthermore, he denied any knowledge or memory of being abused. But in his play, he enacted scenes that exactly replicated a pornographic movie made by the babysitter. This highly visual and inactive form of memory, appropriate to young children, seems to be mobilized in adults as well as in circumstances of overwhelming terror. These unusual features of traumatic memory may be based on alterations in the central nervous system. A wide array of animal experiments show that when high levels of adrenaline and other stress hormones are circulating, memory traces are deeply imprinted. The same traumatic engraving of memory may occur in human beings. The, psychi the psychiatrist Bessel van der Kolk speculates that in states of high sympathetic nervous system arousal, the linguistic encoding of memory is inactivated, and the central nervous system reverts to the sensory and iconic forms of memory that predominate in early life. Just as traumatic memories are unlike ordinary memories, traumatic dreams are unlike ordinary dreams. In form, these dreams share many of the unusual features of the traumatic memories that occur in waking states. They often include fragments of the traumatic event in exact form, with little or no imaginative elaboration. Identical dreams often occur repeatedly. They are often experienced with terrified, terrifying immediacy, as if occurring in the present. Small, seemingly insignificant environmental stimuli occurring during these dreams can be perceived as signals of a hostile attack, arousing violent reactions. And traumatic nightmares can occur in stages of sleep in which people do not ordinarily dream. Thus, in sleep as well as in waking life, traumatic memories appear to be based in an altered neurophysical organization. Tra traumatized people relive the moment of trauma not only in their thoughts and dreams, but also in their actions. The reenactment of trauma scenes is most apparent in the repetitive play of children. Tear di differentiates between normal play and the forbidden games of children who have been traumatized. The everyday play of childhood is free and easy. It is bubbly and light-spirited, whereas the play that follows from trauma is grim and monotonous. Play does not stop easily when it is traumatically inspired, and it may not change much over time. As opposed to ordinary child's play, post-traumatic play is obsessively repeated. Post-traumatic play is so literal that if you spot it, you may be able to guess the trauma with few other clues. 
Adults as well as children often feel impelled to recreate the moment of terror, either in literal or in dis disguised form. Sometimes people reenact dangerous a dangerous encounter. Sometimes people reenact the tra traumatic moment with a fantasy of changing the outcome of the dangerous encounter. In their attempts to undo the traumatic moment, survivors may even put themselves at risk of further harm. Some reenactments are consciously chosen. The rape survivor Sohalia Abdullah Abdullali describes her determination to return to the scene of the trauma. I always hated feeling like something's got the better of me. When this thing happened, I was at such a vulnerable age. I was at 17. I had to prove that they weren't going to get me down. The guys who raped me told me if I ever find out, find you out here alone again, uh, we're going to get you. And I believed them. So it's always a bit of terror walking up that lane because I'm always afraid I'll see them. In fact, no one I know would walk up that lane at night alone because it's just not safe. People have been mugged, and there's no question that it's dangerous. Yet part of me feels that if I don't walk there, then they'll have gotten me. And so, even more than other people, I will walk up that lane. More commonly, traumatized people find themselves reenacting some aspect of the trauma in disguised form, without realizing what they are doing. The incest survivor Sharon Simone recounts how she became aware of a link between her dangerous risk-taking behavior and her childhood history of abuse. For a couple of months, I had been playing chicken on the highway with men, and, and finally I was involved in an auto accident. A male truck driver was trying to cut me off, and I said to myself in the crudest of language, there's no effing way you're going to push your penis into my lane. Like, right out of the blue. Boom. Like that. That was really strange. I had not really been dealing with any of the incest issues. I knew vaguely there was something there, and I knew I had to deal with it, and I didn't want to. I just had a lot of anger at men. So I let this man smash into me, and it was a, a humongous scene. I really was out of control uh, when I got out of the car, just raging at this man. I didn't tell my therapist about it for six weeks. I just filed it away. When I told I got confronted, it's very dangerous, so I made a contract that I would deal with my issues with men. Not all reenactments are dangerous. Some, in fact, are adaptive. Survivors may find a way to integrate reliving experiences into their lives in a contained, even socially useful manner. The combat veteran Ken Smith describes how he managed to recreate some aspects of his war experience in civilian life. I was in Vietnam 8 months, 11 days, 12 hours, and 45 minutes. These things you remember. I remember it exactly. I returned home a much different person from when I left. I went to work as a paramedic, and I found a considerable amount of self-satisfaction out of doing that work. It was almost like a continuance of what I had been doing in Vietnam, but on a much, much lower capacity. There was no gunshot trauma. There was... No burn trauma. I wasn't seeing sucking chest wounds or amputations or shrapnel. I was seeing a lot of medical emergencies, a lot of diabetic emergencies, and a lot of elderly people. Once in a while, there would be an auto accident, which would be the juice. I would turn on the sirens and know I'm going to something, and the adrenaline rush that would run through my body would fuel me for the next 100 calls. There is something uncanny about reenactments. Even when they are consciously chosen, they have a feeling of involuntariness. Even when they are not dangerous, they have a driven, tenacious quality. Freud named his recurrent intrusion of traumatic experience the repetition compulsion. He first conceptualized it as an attempt to master the traumatic event. But this explanation did not satisfy him. It somehow failed to capture what he called the demonic quality of reenactment. Because the repetition compulsion seemed to defy any conscious intent and to resist change so adamantly, Freud despaired of finding any adaptive, life-affirming explanation for it. Rather, he was driven to invoke the concept of a death instinct. Most theories have rejected this Manichaean explanation, concurring with Freud's initial formulation. They speculate that the re repetitive reliving of the dr traumatic experience must represent a spontaneous, unsuccessful attempt at healing. Janae spoke with a person's need to assimilate and liquidate traumatic experience, which, when accomplished, produces a feeling of triumph. In his use of language, Janae 
implicitly recognized that helplessness con constitutes a, the essential insult of trauma, and that restitution requires the restoration of a sense of efficacy and power. The traumatized person, he believes, remains confronted by a difficult situation, one in which he has not been able to play a satisfactory part one to which his ad adaptation has been perfect, imperfect, so that he continues to make efforts at adaptation. More recent theorists also conceptualize intrusion phenomena, including reenactments, as spontaneous attempts to integrate the traumatic event. The psychiatrist Marty Horowitz postulates a completion principle, which summarizes the human mind in mind's intrinsic ability to process new information in order to bring up to date the inner schemata of the self and the world. Trauma, by definition, shatters these inner schemata. Horowitz suggests that unassimilated traumatic experiences are stored in a special kind of active memory, which has an intrinsic tendency to repeat the representation of contents. The trauma is resolved only when the survivor develops a new mental schema for understanding what has happened. The psychoanalyst Paul Russell conceptualizes the emotional rather than the cognitive experience of the trauma as the driving force of repetition compulsion. What is reproduced is what the person needs to feel in order to repair the injury. He sees the repetition compulsion as an attempt to relive uh, and master the overwhelming feelings of traumatic event. The predominant unresolved feeling must be terror, helpless rage, or simply the undifferentiated adrenaline rush of moral danger. Reliving a trauma may offer an opportunity for mastery, but most survivors do not consciously seek or welcome the opportunity. Rather, they dread and fear it. Reliving the traumatic experience, whether in the form of intrusive memories, dreams, or actions, carries with it the emotional intensity of the original event. The survivor is continually buffeted by terror and rage. These emotions are qualitatively different from the ordinary fear and anger. They are outside the range of ordinary emotional experience, and they overwhelm the ordinary capacity to bear feelings. Because reliving a traumatic experience provokes such intense emotional stress, distress, tra traumatized people go to great lengths to avoid it. The effort to ward off intrusive symptoms through though self-protective in, in intent further aggravates the post-traumatic symptom for the attempt to avoid reliving the trauma too often results in a narrowing of consciousness, a withdrawal from engagement with others, and an impoverished life. I'm going to stop right there. There's actually a little bit more to the chapter, but it's a lot of pages. I'm trying to make this video shorter than the last one. Um, but uh, really unpacking that, there was a lot of information in that in that um, part of the chapter. Um, and um, really just a lot of definition, a lot of um, spelling things out. Um, you know, and, and me being someone who has, uh, you know, been educated in... in uh, psychology and mental health, it's easy for me to kind of take this information and assimilate it um, to what I already know. Um, but if this is your first time hearing it, then for sure it's a lot to hear, it's a lot to make sense of, it's a lot to unpack. Um, so uh, I do want to go through it um, as best as I can. Um, again, if there's something that I missed that you want to hear more about, please let me know. Um, give me give me some comments, give me some feedback uh, so I can... Um, so I can expound more on, on things if I've missed anything. Um, but, you know, we talked about terror and we talked about intrusion, right? Um, terror being the part of the trauma experience in which your body is still responding as if you are, um, you are uh, experiencing the thing that, um, that gave you that terror to begin with, right? Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be combat. It doesn't have to be even abuse. It could be something as jarring as a car accident, right? Um, you know, uh, that terror, that, that, that feeling of impending doom or death, right? I think they described it in that way or something similar. Um, that is, that is one of the most, um, you know, marked ways or marked factors of, of, um, of, of trauma, uh, you know, and, and it really is, um, honestly one of the most foundational parts of it too. Um, because without that terror, without that, that, um, feeling of death or that feeling of, of impending death, 
um, or possible sudden death, um, you know, you might you might carry on as if you know that was that was a um, a rough thing to go through, but it, it didn't really change my my idea of my world, right? And and that's 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 really and truly. Um, what trauma does. It's what makes something traumatic. It's something that is jarring enough that it changes how you are seeing your life um, in, in, in a negative way, right? Um, you know, where where originally you felt safe, secured, um, you could walk down that alleyway, right, um, without being attacked, right? As soon as that experience happens, as soon as you get mugged or whatever the, the case may be, um, your idea, your mental idea, your mental picture or schema as, as is used in, in the psychology world, um, that is changed now. Um, and not only is, is, is it, is it jarring that your, your, um, schema has changed, but, um, it's jarring also that you can no longer trust what you thought was happening before, right? Um, it, you can no longer trust your instinct about where you are in terms of safety, in terms of security and things like that, right? Um, so it's a twofold thing. It's not just, oh, this, you know, just assimilating, okay, that's a bad neighborhood. It's, it's also having to second guess yourself now because where else, what else is a place that I feel safe in that is actually not safe for me in all cases, right? Um, so that's a really big part of it. That's a really big deal. Um, you know, really having that shift of schema and, and not being able to, um, you know, uh, at least immediately, um, cope with it, right? Immediately say, well, you know what, my idea of safety, um, and my experience in this, in this place do not line up, right? Um, so, you know, like I said, you're not just questioning that place now, you're questioning what makes me feel safe in a place. And once you start to question anything like that, um, you know, any, anything about emotions, how you feel, any of your senses, um, all other experience or many other experiences at the least um, become uh, not just troublesome and, and hard to cope with, but also traumatic in their own ways, right? Um, you know, going to a social event after, um, you know, being, let's say, let's say, keep the example of you were mugged in an alleyway, right? Going to other places, um, you know, that, that even feel similar, right? Um, and that's, that's, I think it, it made the comment, you know, the, the trauma remains, right? The trauma stays as if, as if you haven't left that environment, right? And it's because your body is, is now not sure how to apply, like I said, that schema you once had to places, uh, that it once felt secure in. And so now it's just on high alert. Now it's just like, well, obviously this can come at a place where we once felt safe. So now all these other places where we feel safe, we got to be on alert because we, we want to be sure that if there is a danger, um, you know, in this place that we are ready for it. Um, and even the fact that you now, your brain is now um, doing that uh, to protect you. Um, that is also um, another thing, like I said, it just adds to the layer of the trauma experience, right? Um, the fact that now your brain feels as though it has to work twice as hard to perceive what's around you, um, that not only makes it harder, um, but it, it, it causes, uh, you know, just an exhaustion, right, of resources because you're working twice, twice as hard now, right? That means your sleep becomes less restful or you need more of it, right? Um, it, it, it means that, um, you know, at the very least your sleep is anxious and fitful, right? Um, uh, like I said, it stops becoming restful. It stops becoming, um, uh, is something that, that rejuvenates you because still, even in your dream state, your brain is trying to stay on alert because again, we don't, now it doesn't know what to trust as, as a feeling of safety. Um, it talks about intrusion too. Um, in that, um, uh, you know, again, it, it's, it's another one of those very pervasive, um, uh, things about trauma, right? Um, and it goes hand in hand with the, with the sense of terror, right? Um, what I just described, uh, when you are, um, when you're experiencing that terror once again, um, or, or, you know, continuously, um, as if it never stopped, um, 
your 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 sense of perception like i said is going to be working in overdrive right so that anything that even feels a little bit like the experience that you have is going to bring back um, that memory, that experience, almost in full color, right? Um, oftentimes, uh, people who struggle with trauma, they they um, they feel the emotion of fear as if they are in that event again. Um, you know, some people can even have psychosomatic symptoms where their 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 you know limbs are hurting in the same way. Um, you know, where they can feel it as if they are experiencing it once again. And then, of course, um, like I said, the, the more psychological things, um, just the confusion, the disorientation, all of that comes flooding back as well. Um, you know, and again, it's it's because your brain is trying to, um, it's trying to help, right? Uh, and I think I mentioned this in an earlier video, your brain is trying to fix the situation. And they even mentioned it in this chapter, right? Um, your 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 brain is going to constantly be trying to win right to claim victory over this situation um and and that's you know what they were what um uh, judith herman was was mentioning about um uh you know having to recreate the 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 situation in order to um uh reestablish a memory of of that happening in which you came out on top right you came out as the victor in the situation um you know and that's again a part of your brain trying to fix the situation and you know and as it said in some ways that can be good in some ways that can be negative right in some ways that can continue um to endanger the person if they're you know returning to the scene of the crime right um whereas you know in the story of the paramedic you know the war veteran who decided to work as a paramedic right using that that um that vigilance that um that response to the trauma that he experienced while um overseas or while deployed in a positive way right using that adrenaline uh to help people to to be a good paramedic right um but uh you know it raises the question how, how where's the line in between good and bad on this um and how do you how do you identify negative uh a negative response um in this way um, and how do you convert it to a positive? Um, and just real briefly, um, I only got a few minutes left here, but just real briefly, um, you know, a very good rule of thumb, obviously, you know, the way that we even um, address what a disorder is, um, is, you know, something that you're experiencing that is, um, is intruding upon uh, some or all, some, most, or all of your uh, uh, social spheres or spheres of life, right? So if, let's say, it is an addiction, right? Um, you know, uh, does that, does that cause, uh, problems in your home life? And then does it cause problems at work? And then also, um, you know, does it also cause problems with sleep? Does it cause problems with all, all these other things, right? Um, that's how we know it's a disorder, um, m most clearly, right? Um, so the same way with these, with these, uh, you know, negative responses, right? Um, is it affecting how you sleep? Probably. Um, that's what trauma does typically. Um, is it affecting how you socialize? Do you socialize or have you stopped because of a fear of, of um, experiencing these symptoms while in public, right? There's a humiliation piece to all this. Um, or just that lack of, of um, trust in your feelings of safety, right? Um, uh, is it something that um, keeps you from uh, sharing things with your spouse? Um, does it keep you from... Uh, uh, or does it encourage you to um, picking up negative things? For example, let's say substance abuse um, or self-harm or, um, you know, any sort of, of maladaptive sort of thing. That's a pretty good indicator that it's negative, right? Um, and uh, again, you know, the difference between a negative and a positive response here is just going to be is it making things worse or is it making things better, right? Um, even in terms of addiction, I think, uh, you know, some people might answer right away like, oh, it is actually helping, you know, it, it keeps my, my negative thoughts down, but is it really helping, right? Is that, a, you know, because even if an addiction um, may begin 
or or at least on surface level seem to be helping on the on below the surface it is not right of course you're putting you're putting toxins into your body at, at a level that is unhealthy um, you know, your, your sleep is never going to be restful. Your socialization is going to be affected by this too. Um, so those are some good rule of thumbs. Whereas a, a, an adaptive one, like I said, you know, is this improving things, right? Um, the war veteran was able to channel that in a positive way and in a rewarding way, right? Um, you know, kind of using that towards something that is helping other people help, you know, it, it's a job for him too. It's bringing in money. Um, and it's allowing him to, to regain, uh, positive memory of similar situations in which he's able to save people. He's able to, um, he's able to help people and, 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 you know, not, um, maybe have so much memory of, of, you know, death and, 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 you know, mangled limbs and things like that, as he described. Right. So, um, again, those are, those are some, uh, rules of thumb for that. Um, and you know, how do you change it? Well, you start by, you know, as we always say in the therapy world, you start by identifying the problem and admitting it, right? Um, that is always step one, and it, it seems like such an easy step, but it's not always, um, you know, and, and I want to validate that um, if you are someone who, you know, is trying to come to terms with what you're going through, um, it is not easy. Um, but once you've done it, uh, that um, acceptance of what is the truth of the situation, what is the reality, that will be a huge first step into moving towards, um, you know, better coping skills and a better me mental health in general. Um, I'm going to wrap things up right now. Um, like I said, I, I don't have much time today. Um, but um, again, like I said, if, if there's something in this chapter that was mentioned that I missed, um, please let me know. Um, and I will, I will um, you know, create a, a special video just for the sake of explaining that for you. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, give me some comments, give me some feedback, give me some recommendations, and I will read them, and I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.